And here is our next one that we're going to identify, just so you can get a good look at it here. And this leaf pattern is going to change it up a bit on us here. Already we can see it has little leaflets. So the leaflets is going to be a different category. We already know it's deciduous. It's not an evergreen. It doesn't have needles. So it is deciduous. And then... Let's see if I can get it on camera here. It has these little leaflets coming out of a single stalk. So you can see all along here, there's a single stalk with the leaflets coming out. That's going to re represent a type of compound uh, leaf attachment pattern. What makes this one a little bit different, guys, is that the small leaflets are growing out of the stalks, okay? But then those smaller stalks are connected onto a bigger stalk, if that makes sense. Let me raise this up a little bit. So there's our leaflets to a, a stalk. And then there is the stalk connected to a larger stalk. Does that make sense? What that's going to be called is twice compound. So that's a twice compound leaf pattern. see if I could show you here. So there's our leaflets. Leaflets connected to a single stalk. That single stalk is connected to a bigger stalk or branch here. Also, when we look at the leaf attachment pattern overall, You can see it's alternating. They're not completely opposite of each other, they're alternating. Just like that American basswood was. Okay, so knowing what we know, let's go to our graph. We know it's going to be compound, and it's actually going to be twice compound. Then the twice compound has an alternate leaf attachment, which is going to bring us to 227 to 231. And then what you would do is look for other identifying factors on the tree throughout those pages. And I happen to know that this is a honey locust. With the Latin name being... Gledistia, Gledistia, man, Gledistia, Triacanthos, sorry guys, my Latin isn't that great, and there you see there, it's a twice compound, alternate leaf attachment pattern, and there is an example of the leaves, so there's the picture in the book. There's our leaves there. When it's in season, it does have this, uh, this fruit on it and the flowers. And then how we could identify now is let's take a look at the bark. Let me bring up the book. 
there's the bark right there in the picture and there is our bark so I always know honey locust to be kind of a reddish tint it's a reddish cover and um, it cracks and peels so aside from the leaf pattern it's a reddish color with cracking and peeling along it. Another thing that identifies the uh, honey locust is it has thorns. It develops thorn-like material on the branches. So it's, it seems very thorny. And I can attest to that when mowing the lawn here. Let's see if I can pick up any of them. So right here, right there and right there a couple of main purposes for the honey locust tree guys is that the fruit that grows I'm going to bring down the book one more time this fruit right here which isn't really fruit for us but it is fruit for animals, squirrels that run around here and stuff like that. So that's the main use of this tree as it sits right here in our yard. The second main purpose for this is I've actually, it's not easy, but if you could find some of the good bark that's coming off of it, I have used the bark as platforms for fires, and it makes great ash and great coals for cooking over the coals. It burns very well, and it develops a nice bed of coals to cook on. And one more thing, you might be able to see right there where the branches were sticking out. We've sawed some of them off just to keep things safe around here and it's very very good for the wood burning stove so this honey locust wood burns great in the wood burning stove it burns hot and it burns long so that is our honey locust guys okay guys here's our next one Let's get over here. So we, as opposed to leaves, we're dealing with needles now. So we know it's a needle tree. It's an evergreen. So that's going to be a conifer as opposed to uh, the deciduous ones that we just did. When it comes to conifer, what you want to keep in mind is it's either going to be a single needle. Like a single needle is going to come out of the stalk there. Or they're going to be clusters. It's going to be multiple needles coming out of one spot. So this one here, we know that's going to be a single needle. See all those single needles? There's not a cluster of needles coming out of each spot. It's just a single needle. When it comes to these guides, a lot of the time, it's easier or less steps. You just have to go through more pages to go through these. So I'm going to bring up the book here. And we know, if it's a, we know that it's a conifer, and we know that it's single needle. So that's going to bring us to pages 3 through 17. So we're going to turn to 3 through 17. We're going to go through that until we find it. And I happen to know that this is a white spruce, which is Pikea Glauca. Pikea Glauca, if I'm saying that right. So we know it's a single needle. And that's mainly what we need to know. There's our picture in the book. And there is our tree right there. There's no pine cones now, but let's look at the ever important bark.
There's our bark right there. Sorry, guys. Here comes the book. There's the bark in the book. And there's our bark right there. Essentially, the way to tell that this is a white spruce is the bark is gray in color. Whoops, sorry guys. The bark is gray in color. And if you can see right there, the inner bark is like a salmon pink. So as some of you guys know, I can go on and on and on about our conifer trees, especially pine trees, or this white spruce tree. Um, the, best uh, the best fire trees in all of the Northeast. That is our key right there. You see that sap? That sap is what's pumped out from the bottom of the tree whenever there's a wound. And that sap is good for adhesive. So you can mix that with white ash out of the campfire and create a good adhesive. I have also used that in first aid purposes. It has a antiseptic value and you can put that and close up a cut. I'm not a doctor, so I wouldn't recommend doing it off of what I'm saying but I have put it on cuts before and it's worked kind of like I just said, it's an adhesive and it has antisep antiseptic purposes. So I have actually closed cuts and stopped small cuts, you know, knife cuts on my hands and have stopped it with the pine pitch there. You can also repair tarps with it once you mix it and make the glue. Now this one doesn't have any branches down here, but once you look up there, you can see the branches. And should you break or saw any of those branches off, right in that crotch area is gonna be fat wood. And that's gonna help you start your fire as well. That's very flammable. I love fat wood, as do a lot of guys. And then these little stalks, once the temperature starts to change, you get these little stalks that are dried out, break right off. Those are great for your early stages of your fire, for your pencil lead material. So I thought I'd throw in a conifer there, guys, and be able to identify that. And let's do one more, guys. Identify this beauty right here. So let's start with the leaves here. Be a little closer here. Okay, we know it's deciduous, and we see leaves coming off leaflets coming off of a single stalk so that's going to be compound and see how they're directly across from each other we're going to call that compound opposite can you see that okay so leaves are opposite sides of each other and it's leaflets coming off of a single stalk, which makes it compound. 
So we're going to call that compound opposite. And then when we look through, we're going to go through our table, of course, and the graph is going to guide us. And I'm going to bring the book. I'm going to let this go. We know it's deciduous. We know it's compound. And we know it's an opposite leaf pattern. I know that this is green ash. Or in Latin, Frasinus pensilvensia. And there's our leaf pattern on the book. And then let's take a look at the bark. There's no fruit on there now, but there's the fruit and there's the bark. So let's get a zoom in on the bark here, bring you a little closer. So there's our bark. See how it's brown and it has the diamond shaped grooves? Here comes the book. There's our bark there. And there's our bark there. As far as green ash goes, guys, it's known very much for the strength of the wood. Um, once again, you have ash furniture. I know it's very popular with the Amish. They make ash furniture a lot. And then interestingly enough, ash is used a lot for uh, baseball bats and tennis rackets. And I've even read somewhere that the cricket, I don't know what they call them, cricket bats, are used from ash a lot of the time. So I've never used this particular wood for bushcrafting. Um, it's, it's remained solid, so I've never cut into it or tried to strip the inner bark or anything like that. I just know it's very strong. And from what I know about green ash, um, furniture is made from green ash. And I also know that sporting equipment, uh, baseball bats and things like that are made from green ash. So that is a couple uses of green ash, guys. Okay, guys. So I hope I was able to give a little bit of a tutorial there and kind of give you an idea of how these field guides will work. Um, I know when you're first taking in, for, in this information, it's not really clear or it seems like there's a lot to it. If you have any questions, please just ask me. And also, once you start reading these guides, guys, they start to make sense and you'll see exactly what I'm referring to. But I just thought this might help. Um, give you a little bit more fun in the woods when you're out there or just in the outdoors in general um, your own yard or parks or things like that i thank you for watching i appreciate seeing everybody and we'll talk to you again down the road guys thanks bye bye